Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grandview Christian Assembly. Would you please join us as we praise the Lord? Hi, I'm John Meyer. I'm the lead pastor here at Grandview Christian Assembly, and we are nearing the end of a really long study in the book of Revelation, uh, especially as we get to the end of the book and the closing stretch of it. There are a lot of very relative factors. Um, for instance, right now, our world is focused on stopping a virus. This is a global experience that we've all entered into. We have shuttered places, we have shuttered activities, and we kind of all think if we could just get through this, then that would be, that would be our goal achieved. But uh, it may be that God's aiming for something else. I, I want you to just take a step back for a minute and Consider it this way. Not just us, but God has shut down movie theaters. 
He shut down shopping malls. He shut down gyms. He shut down bars. He shut down sports stadiums, parties, celebrations, civic centers, even, listen to this, even casual church going has been shut down. These are all places that people hide from him. I mean, even, even in church, yes, even in church, people, um, people could be sitting in a packed out worship service, hiding in plain sight. In other words, they're telling themselves, uh, I'm okay, look at me, I went to church. But the point is that all these places are places where indifference and even obstinance toward God breed. And now... Now he's rocked our world. It's like a, it's like a, a day the earth stood still kind of moment. And, and he's accomplished the whole thing with something smaller than the head of a pin. Now what's, what's going to be the outcome of this whole thing? Well, uh, aside from the economic and the, uh, the social um, fallout, and we know that there's going to be some fallout. The people of God, this is what's going to happen. The people of God are going to find Christ in a deeper way than they ever have before. All right, that's one thing. Matter of fact, some folks are going to find Jesus for the first time. Now, that, at least that's what we hope. And everybody else, all the rest, uh, they're going to get through this, and they're going to survive it, and they're going to do it without any kind of spiritual benefit at all. And, and that's sad. Uh, maybe they'll become even more resilient to Christ. In fact, I think that after this whole thing is over, there's going to be quite a bit of bragging. But today in our study... Uh, what we're going to see is that there will be a time for God's nuanced confrontations to be at an end. The days of uh, God's discipline through mediatorial events is going to be over. God won't work through things anymore like the, the commercial crash that we saw in the preceding couple of chapters of Revelation, chapters 17 and 18, or even a virus. He won't work through those things anymore. In fact, our subject this morning is that Christ will come with His faithful believers and directly confront, directly confront the world's rebellion. This is known as his second coming and the public aspect of it. This is what has been popularly called Armageddon. Now, the Christ that comes to do this is, uh, is different than the Jesus that we probably heard about and learned about in Sunday school. And uh, Revelation chapter 19, 11, look at how this, this opens up. It says, then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. This is not Jesus on Palm Sunday. You know, we're coming up on Palm Sunday soon. This is not like Jesus entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, riding in on a donkey, mild and meek. This is a grand entrance here. This is a, a war stallion coming down out of heaven. And, and notice that the verse doesn't say the one sitting on it is Jesus. Instead, it says the one sitting on it is called faithful and true. It mentions the one. Instead of quickly labeling him as Jesus, the scriptures want you to travel into a description of this Christ. It wants you to feel him. 
in this moment. And it says, first of all, that he is, he's faithful. He's faithful. Do you know, more than anything else, Jesus is faithful to God. He's not faithful to our comfort. He's not faithful to our preferences. He is faithful more than anything else to his Father God. And it says he's also called true. And this is in reference not to your truth or my truth. You know how that's a popular saying now. This or that is my truth. It is the truth that he represents here. Nor is this Jesus coming in to forgive. He's coming in righteousness to judge. Nor is he coming in to make peace. The scriptures tell us here he's coming in to make war. Now this is totally different, I realize, than what we're used to hearing. These verses don't preach in places and to preferences that want a comfortable Christ. But they keep on going. In verse 12, it says, His eyes are like a flame of fire. Now, in the Song of, of, Song of Solomon, it says, His eyes are, li His eyes are like doves. Um, not here. His eyes are like a flame of fire here. Now, why? His eyes are like fire to burn off all the ground clutter. To burn off all the noise and to expose every hidden thing. And it also says on his head are many diadems. Those are crowns. On Jesus' head are many crowns. That symbolizes, that shows his unlimited authority. You see, earlier in the book, it says that the dragon, Satan, had uh, seven diadems on his head and, and the beast, Antichrist, had ten on his head. But these are crowns on the head of Christ that are, with, are without number. They are unlimited. They represent unlimited authority. And then it says he has a name written that no one knows but himself. Now, quickly, when we see this, he has a name written that no one knows. Right away, I think most Christians would say, well, I know it. His name's Jesus. I know. But um, no amount of hand-me-down knowledge can say, I know, when the Bible is saying no one knows. In other words, this person is profound. Because Christ is divine. He's the divine Son of God. There are things about Him that are inaccessible. They're not easy. You can only know them by entering deeply into who Christ is and into the nature of His work. And in verse 13, it says, He's clothed in a robe, dipped in blood. Now, there's a dual meaning here, obviously. There's a dual meaning. Uh, there's the blood that Jesus shed for us on his cross, and he's been offering it to mankind for thousands of years now. There's that blood. But then when mankind has steadfastly re rejected it, like here in, this, in these verses, then this blood is not only his blood, it is their blood that he is about to shed. It's about to get real. And again, it says the name by which he is called is the word of God. Look at how the scripture is so concerned with you knowing his identity without quickly saying Jesus, but wanting you to enter into the feeling of this person, the awe of this person. The name by which he is called is the word of God. The, the Bible keeps avoiding proper nouns here. 
instead offering descriptive names. It harkens back to John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There are no easy answers here. Oh, I know, I know. There are no easy answers here. We only know Christ by knowing the Word of God. That is the best way to know Him. And now in verse 14, here's where you come in. Verse 14, And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following Him on white horses. Now right away, you may think, well, these are angels, of course, and heavenly dignitaries, but um, that's not all. Because the description of the clothing here, if you look, it's fine linen, it's white, it's pure, matches the description of the clothing that we find earlier in this chapter in verses 7 and 8, where this clothing is worn by the bride of Christ, the saints, the typical believers in Jesus. And as His loyal followers now, they are lining up on Him. That's what the believers do. Hopefully, we've got some experience right now lining up on the living Word of God. Verse 15 says, From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. You know, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says the word of God is living and operative, sharper than any two-edged sword. This sword is the word coming out of his mouth. This is that same word that has called the universe into existence, it's the same word that announces the gospel to you in order to save you. And here, ultimately, it is that word that judges. We simply line up on that word. In verse 16, it says, On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written. Again, there's the name. You can see God's desire to get you into knowing this person. And that name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You can't know Jesus without knowing Him as Lord. You don't know Christ unless you know Him as King of Kings, as Lord of Lords, as the one that has the ultimate say-so in your life. And for these rebellious nations right here at this time, it's a terrible time to, to learn that lesson because at this point in Revelation, it's too late to learn it. So you put these verses all together, you package them all together. This is the Christ that God wants you to know here in Revelation as someone formidable and conquering. He's not for sentimental consumption. We're not supposed to just be looking at him and it being inspired by him. Listen, I remember um, I saw an episode of Pawn Stars and uh, there was a guy that came into the shop. He had this um, antique military firearm and of course he wanted a mint for it. So um, the shop owner, Rick Harrison, you know, he's the big star of the program, said, uh, I, uh, I don't know anything about this, about this weapon, so let's call in an expert. So in comes the expert, and he starts to, he starts to look at this, this, this rifle, and, uh, and he, he says, well, this was probably never used in a war. And then the expert looked at it a little bit more, and he says, I don't think that this has ever been fired before. And then he looked at it a little bit more closely and said, this can't be fired. This was manufactured in a craft shop in order to be hung on somebody's wall. And you could tell the owner of the weapon that, you know, he was crestfallen and really humiliated. And uh, they did an outtake interview with him in the parking lot of the pawn shop. And they asked him, well, what are you going to do with it now? And he said, well, I'm going 
I think I'll take it home and put it on my wall. And I could see in the shot over his shoulder there was a dumpster. And I was thinking, dude, if I were you, I would just take that thing and slam dunk it right there in the dumpster. It's just worthless. But Christ is not supposed to be a decoration for human life. He's effective in the real world. He works. And particularly, he works God's will on earth. And, and, and with this knowledge, we ought to be stirred to greater trust and confidence in him. In fact, he works so powerfully and so well, uh, the restraint that he, he has shown toward us is amazing, given the amount of rebellion that we've shown toward him. Just think about it. This, uh, this current virus, it could have a 100% fatality rate. It could spread a whole lot, a lot easier. God could easily ramp up this whole thing. But instead, you know, at this current time, he's chosen to deal with our rebellion, with self-sacrifice, love, and patience. You know, the same Christ who could easily destroy the whole world chose to die defenseless on a cross for us and on a cross for you. And now he just calls everybody to repent. He calls them all to repent. Some of us he's called multiple times. The way that he's endured our stubbornness is miraculous. It's not that when he works, it's miraculous. It's that when he refuses to do, to carry out destructive judgments, that's miraculous because he could so easily do it. But never mistake his patience for impotence. In fact, in conclusion, I'd like to introduce you to one verse outside of the book of Revelation. This is Jude 14, where it says, uh, Jude 14 and 15, where it says, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of His holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against Him. The Lord is coming and He's coming with us. He's got company. He's not alone. He's coming with us to deal with all the ungodly deeds and words. But before that time, before that time, there is that matter of um, stubbornness and rebellion in our own hearts. Before we talk about the world and God judging the world, there's something wrong with me. And there's something wrong with you. Now, let's be honest. There are areas of all of our hearts where we have, um, maybe the Lord has spoken a number of times about it and we've ignored him. We've written him off. We've excused things away. Or we just flat out said no. So before that he enforces his lordship on the whole world, we have to uh, make sure that his lordship exists in our hearts. I'll say a prayer. Lord, I pray for all those watching this broadcast, especially in these moments, that we would first of all respond to your offer of salvation and take you seriously. And Lord, for those of us that have believed in you already, Lord, I pray that there would be obedience, perfect obedience shown to you. Give us all grace that we would trust you, that we would obey you, and that we would serve you. In your name we pray. Amen. Now at this point, uh, Jacob, 
will introduce us to our last song. All right, so the, the last song that we're going to do today um, is a song called Great Are You, Lord. Um, and what I wanted to draw attention to was uh, the lyrics in the bridge, and they read, And all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing, Great Are You, Lord. And not only does this really reflect what we even talked about last week with, with Michael, um, of the great multitudes in heaven rejoicing, um, but this even harkens to what we just read, um, even in 16. Um, on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So I would ask that, uh, that you would join us in singing this song and, and let, us, let us think of that time to come when we will all be rejoicing um, together um, as one singing, Great Are You, Lord. Will cry, these bones will sing. Rain. 
Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Please stay with the Grandview Christian Assembly social media pages for updates. If you enjoyed the music this morning, we have posted links to our YouTube page so you can listen to them as much as you want. Uh, we also have our sermon posted to our Grandview Christian Assembly website if you would like to re-listen. We'll see you next week. Thank you.